Hi, everybody. I'm Betsy Billhorn, and welcome to Under the Forelock, where we'll be talking to interesting people doing interesting things with horses. It is my great pleasure today to introduce Craig Stevens, who has been a trainer, a clinician, and an instructor for over 50 years. Uh, he began his work in French classical equitation, studying other under masters who have been part of the cadre noir. He's also traveled extensively in France and Portugal and studied under, uh, you know, likes of, and I'm going to, I'm going to totally mangle these names. So I apologize ahead of time. Catherine Durant, Michelle Enrique, and Juan Oliveira. Um, I and, just said it perfect. X, yay. All right. Okay. And uh, so <laughs> Craig is also the founder of the uh, foundation for, of the equestrian arts and he's been teaching and clinicking all throughout Europe in the U.S. for the last 20 years. So, Craig, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for taking time with us today. My pleasure. Yeah. Well, I should say at the end, my pleasure. Well, yeah, we don't know how it's going to go, right? <laughs> <laughs> May not be pleasure. <laughs> um, so, so, Craig, um, one of the things, you know, you know you've, you've studied, um, you know, you've been a student of the horse for 50 years, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So can you talk a little bit about, I mean, 50 years is a long time, and that's a lot of horses. Um, what, what is that like? Huh. Um, well, it's, it's, been, it, it's, it's been and it's become the central focus, obviously, of, of um, uh, my emotional and intellectual life um, in that period of time. And, and um, I think everybody, I mean, one of my difficulties was trying to find when I was younger where I belonged and how to focus and where to focus and what to focus on. And um, um, it wasn't until I was about 21 that I uh, accepted the idea that I was going to be involved in horses uh, professionally or that I was going to, that it was a, a career. And um, um, what led me to it is the fact that um, it was the only thing that I was doing that I would be doing all the time that wasn't aggravation. <laughs> 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 you know, and it was, um, 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 yeah, it, it, trying to um, find something that um, I was interested in it and would pay attention to long enough to, to where I could actually make a living from it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, the, the, the dialogue um, in my head at that time um, was, this is a crappy way to make a living. <laughs> You're not going to make any money at it. You know, it, psychologically, I had to accept the idea that I was involved in a monastic existence and that the end result was probably going to be a life of poverty. And what I was at one point, I, well, I was a professional groom. And what struck me was what the old guys would do. The ones that were, the young guys would be doing all the show grooming. And I was one of the young guys. And I was looking at the, uh, the old guy doing all the crappy work that the young guys didn't want to do. Oh. And then I thought, oh, I could be the old guy. And what would happen if I had no talent? Uh-oh. And I had no ability to do it. I could be that old guy, you know. And then when I accepted this as a direction to go in, was I willing to have that outcome? Mm -hmm. If I could accept that outcome, I could do this for a living. So the, the idea here that I think is um, maybe a takeaway uh, you know, for somebody is, you know, that, um, you know, it's to step off the cliff and hope the ground is there. <laughs> but I think that's, I think that's true in a lot of, things, you know, right? you know, yeah. yeah. And then there's a real, a realization that a life well lived, um, there's an emotional quality to that. And that, money, um, what the accolades of, of doing something well, you know, wasn't important. It was the willingness to make the effort. Mm -hmm. And then stepping off the cliff and saying, yeah. okay, I'm making the effort. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, now universe, take care of me. Yeah. Do you, think, do you think the universe is taking care of you? Oh, <laughs> in spades, in spades. I mean, because it, it, it's, um, God, the horses personally for me, and I think for a lot of people, have been a tremendous source of healing. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and um, I mean, I don't know that people think of it necessarily that way because it's not a you know uh, like a cut <laughs> right, right you know but it's it's in the training and in the work i want to say there are three parts there's the physical part there's the emotional part and then there's the mental part of it and uh, while that's true uh, to some degree and everybody can go yes no no there's only one part, you know, and that's the part I'm living. Mm -hmm. Okay. The division into those three parts uh, creates um, a division inside of you, which actually ends up being obstructive to what you're doing. Horses are simple. Okay. And they don't care what the thinking is. Mm -hmm. as much as they pay attention to the feeling. Right. right. Okay. And that said, this is what most people don't do. Mm -hmm. What they do is they have the right idea. They physically do it. And, oh, and by the way, there's emotion. See, the horse does it the other way. All right. There's emotion. There's what it's doing. And occasionally there's an idea. There's a thought, <laughs> occasionally. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, so to be a good rider, to be a good trainer, is the ability to connect emotionally. All right. First, in your own experience. Okay. And then being able to um, create a, a synchronicity, a synergy. Um, um, uh, between you and the horse and it's 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 it can be based on a lot of things I mean you know to, to some degree um, it's what you think um, it, whatever you think it is is what it is mm -hmm. so in other words like when you have somebody um, if you go out looking at trainers and you have somebody who is uh really crude and rough mm -hmm. and you talk to them about it right it there's a reason that they're like that and I, i'm not saying that it what what they'll usually say is something like oh well the horse made me do that or i had you know it right. becomes something that's necessary because the horse is stupid mm -hmm. when i was young i had a lot of stupid horses that were very difficult to train as I've gotten older, I have very smart horses that are too easy to train. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, the horses haven't changed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it, it's most of the time in our world, we obscure reality by complexity. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Horses won't tolerate that. Now, that's not totally true because you can go out and find trainers that when you talk about working with horses, it's so complicated, you know? And it's like everything in life is extremely simple, very black and white. And yet, when you cast your mind in a certain direction, you can find all the complications that you want. It yeah. can be as simple or as complicated as it needs to be. However, you know, unlike people where you and I can uh, bask in the complexities of whatever subject we choose to, the horses can't go there. So it always comes down to a very simple emotional connection. Okay. Um, that starts out, it can start out in um, harmony. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, or opposition. 
In other words, you and I having a conversation. See, you're working at Harmony. How do I know? You're doing this. Oh, you caught <laughs> me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that, what you're doing is, whether or not you're thinking this, but, this, but the message you're sending me is that we're harmonious. Right, right. Okay. Yep. Yep. So the reason that we're harmonious is your thinking and my thinking are in agreement with each other. So you could sit there and go that way and I can do it too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. 20 years from now, okay, uh, when I'm dead and gone, you won't remember the, the conversation, but you'll remember the harmony. Yeah. Yes. You'd like to Yeah. Yeah, and that's like you... that, um, that Maya Angelou phrase, right? Where she says, is it from Maya Angelou? Maybe I'm attributing to the wrong person, but it's, you know, you won't remember what people did, but you'll remember how they made you feel. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. And, and most of us, that is really where we need to be if we're going to have a good life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because a good life isn't what you think it is. Yeah. It's what you feel it is. You know, that's, that's so interesting that you bring this up because I was having a conversation this morning um, and we were talking about this in a different, uh, different um, aspect, but you know, the, the whole um, thing of getting to do something, right? We were talking about achievements, career achievements, and you get to this place, but it's very empty, right? Because you don't have that richness and that connection with others and that real feeling and a feeling, right? There's no feeling. You have that, you have, you have this bit, oh, I got my giant promotion or I sold my company, but it's, it's very fleeting versus having that richness of relationship with people, right? In kind of that harmonious way. So, um, and that's not, you can't put a price on that, right? That's right. not money at right. all. <clears throat> But it's a little bit, if I can, um, <laughs> proverbial dead horse. Um, if I said to you, here's a bottle of wine, it's a thousand dollars for this bottle of wine. Yep. You know, I bet I can drink it in 10 seconds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You miss the point. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's the texture. You know, it's, it's, you know, so as a connoisseur, I will have a half a glass and wax poetically, wax and wane poetically about the wonders of this particular vintage. <laughs> <laughs> right? Whereas, you know, um, I could drink the bottle, in, you know, the bottle in a, in a couple of minutes and what wine? What was it? I mean, I'd be drunk as a skunk and I'm, maybe on either end, but in one, I experience the quality of the texture mm -hmm. of it. And when people are together and we're working as humans, um, both of us can go off in all these varying directions. And then we can sit here and talk about whether you're right, I'm right, or whether, you, you know, and we can have this very complicated thing go on, but you can't do that with a horse. Right. I can't talk training philosophy with my horse. Mm -hmm. My horse doesn't care. Yeah. My horse is very simple. Feels good. It doesn't feel good. Or the horse doesn't care. Right. Right. That's so, it. so the thing is, you know, it's interesting because you mentioned earlier about that people, we separate the physical, the mental and the emotional. And I mean, I'm wondering if that's where the complexity comes in, right? You know, and where we create a lot of dissonance with a horse because, you know, you talked about the rough trainer and it's like, he's acting in a physical way, right? I'm on the physical plane, right. um, you know, others with a very, you know, oh, do this, this, you know, 20 aids and, you know, go this way, you know, that's more on the mental plane, right? But what's losing there is that emotional connection or right. not an awareness of where the horse is emotionally um, with you, right? That right. harmonization. <clears throat> Right. Yeah. yeah. And that's, um, I mean, it, there's a lot of, um, a guy, it's because I'm a horse person. I'm thinking in my head about, you know, um, well, how do you, how do you encapsulate these ideas? What, what, what's the essential part of it? And it's like, because I'm a horse person, the horse is magical in helping me make those connections. And it calls me on my crap. And it's not because um, I think the horse is uh, intellectually brilliant. Mm -hmm. 
It's because the horse is present. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go off on the future that I hope it to be or on the nightmarish past. Now that's, again, not completely true, but it, it, because they're simple, it's not complicated. So like when I talk to you about, um, you know, awareness, awareness is not something that I can teach. Right, right. Okay, but it is something that I can experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, when I'm teaching a rider or I'm working with a horse, all right, the human needs um, the ideas and whatnot in some ways like a life preserver because it's they can't it, it, we can't um, sometimes deal with the reality of situations so directly so we use our body and we use our intellect as a buffer to keep it from hurting okay yeah okay yeah the horse it's much more direct mm -hmm. you see we'll build the whole storyline about why we're hurt, why, how it's react, how I'm reacting, why I'm reacting, how it ties into, and I go into a litany of this, that, and the other thing. The end result of that conversation is, see, I'm justified in being an idiot. <laughs> right, but I think, you know, it's interesting as you're going through that, and I'm hearing you go through that, you're rationalizing and you're taking away the emotion, right? And you say, right. I'm not hurt, where the horse is like, I hurt, I'm hurting. Right. Like, hello. Right. And it's right. a very short circuit to that. Right. Right. Um, but meanwhile, while we're doing this again, I think it's like taking away the harmony and the attention. Right. right? Because we're taking our own emotions away from the situation via right. rationalization. Right. <clears throat> and, and you're getting into a place to where um, um, you, you once you lose the connection, mm -hmm. increasingly more and more the judgments that yeah. you make, all right, become more and more corrupt. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like um, you, we talked a little bit about uh, the foundation, the equestrian arts. Right. All right. The reason that I went there is that the history of riding is centered around military use. Okay, socially, it's not that there wasn't a social aspect, but when the social aspect of it was extremely strong, a lot of times the horse end of it from the horse's perspective sucks. So an example, um, and I apologize in advance to people that are avid fox hunters. Okay. <laughs> if look at, but if you look at fox hunting, uh, apart from the hunting aspect of it, but as a horse human experience, mm -hmm. uh, one of the most horrific things to watch is the level of, of riding skill mm -hmm. in a hunt. You get people that can barely stay on and yet they're going tally-ho across the fields at a full gallop, you know, try and, and the motivation for that is social. Right. You know, right. And not always, you know, but yeah. I was just thinking there was a point where I was a second rider for a secretary of a very famous hunt. Mm -hmm. Okay, which basically meant I opened the gate for the lady, I helped the lady dismount, I made sure, I tried to make sure that a horse didn't kill her, you know, more or less in a very correct way. Okay, but um, uh, uh, the people that would be involved in this hunt, this was a hunt that uh, Jackie Onassis hunted with. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. So boy, everybody wanted to be at that hunt. Yeah, <laughs> I you know? can imagine. So you got these people that their focus isn't on the horse. Right, right. And you, know, you talked about the, the social, hunt. yeah, well, to right. hunt and then to have the social aspect and the horse is just, right. I don't want to say a tool, but it's kind of a fixture, right? Oh, you know? yeah, well, it's yeah. a dirt bike. It's the same yeah. as a dirt bike. It it's doesn't dirt matter. Bike. It's alive. It, yeah. You know, it has the same function. Yeah. You know, uh, Jackie O doesn't dirt bike, so he had horses. You know, yeah. I mean, right. But, and again, I, I, it, it's not to, to cast aspersions on that th that particular thing, but the the thing is, as a horseman, my preoccupation um, is, uh, what does it feel like for the horse? Right. Uh, right. What's it like for the horse? Is this a good thing for the horse? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, which seems like obvious, and it's not that we're complex beings. So you can have, uh, I don't care about the horse, and I care deeply about the horse coexisting in your head. 
One can be a feeling and one can be a thought. And then people that are, you know, that, that, that primitive trainer, that real crude guy, well, he's, he's on one end of the spectrum and he's not aware of the other. And that's because he's, it, it's, it's through ignorance. Now, when I say ignorance, I'm not meaning it as, oh, you're ignorant and, and pointing a figure, but ignorance in the sense that it's ignore ants. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the essence of that is that you have a narrow field and perspective and you're ignoring a lot. One of the things that that trainer is ignoring is what does it feel like for the horse? Now, right. somebody who might be a, um, a horse lover on to the other extreme yeah. would be so grossly offended by this barbarian. And yet this barbarian will very proudly say, oh, I controlled the horse. I made it happen. And it's a, you know, um, why is that guy being like that? And he's not connecting with us emotionally. All right. Yeah. And what does it also mean? He's also not connecting with himself emotionally. Yeah. Yeah. And you see that parallel a lot, um, you know, but I'd also like to talk about the other end of the spectrum, right? Where the right. person, oh my God, I love my horse. Right. Because I think way on that end too, there's problems as well. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, it, it's, um, there's the, the I, there's an idea of what happens with horse lovers is this false equivalence. Yeah. Okay, and an example could be, uh, look, you and I have two totally different lives, and yet I give you a certain equivalence so that what I feel and what you feel is one and the same. And I make assumptions of, about you because I'm based on, and, we, and you do the same thing. Right, right. And that, there's a false equivalence. It's assuming that there's a harmony and a universality. And within any being, there is always that connection. How do I know? because we're in the universe together. We right. are somehow connected. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> okay, but false <laughs> equivalence is that you assume in the horse exactly the same kind of things mm -hmm. that you do for a human. So example, like when I go over and I want to be, you know, um, uh, tender with you, you know, I'll yep. be very gentle when I come over. All right. Um, you know, and when you watch horses relate to each other, they're not particularly tender. Now, it's not to say there isn't an element of tenderness. Right. But they have absolutely no compunction about giving the other horse a good solid kick. Oh, yeah. Biting yeah. her, you know, <laughs> and it's like, well, this is what I know, is I can't have equivalence with the horse. Yeah. You see, because even a, a comedic kick <laughs> can end my life. <laughs> oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. And so that there's this kind of soft, fluffy thing where you think, you know, oh, you know, this is, and they're exactly like me. And um, I remember when I was a groom, there was we had these two horses that were um, really very in very bad condition because the owner very much loved um, their horse, and they bought the horse the best dog food because it's animal food. Oh, oh, geez. You see, that's yeah. a point. And that's you completely know, oh, different. It's an yeah. animal. It's yeah. equal to. Oh. So <clears throat> what happens is you have an idea, and the idea becomes a telling. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, um, ah, you know, you're one of those women that wear, wear glasses. All women that wear glasses, da 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 Right. So, and it's like, there's no equivalence. The fact that you have a, a glasses on your face doesn't mean that you're like all people with glasses. Now, there may be similarities. Yes, there's something on your nose. <laughs> right, but I'm not, you know, I mean, people might assume I'm smart. <laughs> you know, and maybe so, I'm not, you know. See, but, yeah. in one case, I'm extending, I'm telling, not directly, but indirectly, I'm telling you about you. Right. That I have in my head. Right. That it's equivalent, and it's right. Okay. And that's true. And that's true on both ends of the spectrum, right? Because I mean, you know, we've got the way over here emotional, but we've also got the guy who's like, exactly. I need to have control. I need to write. Yeah. So that's, that's, it's the same problem. Wow. Yeah. And it's, it's not only the same problem, but the reason the two of them can't get along is because they're both suffering from the same issue. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, the guy yeah. that's is totally brutal, and the one that's neurotically kind. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, there's a fundamental commonality there. Mm -hmm. Right. What's wrong with both views is that it starts with telling, not listening. Yep. Yeah. It starts with a bias. So if at some point when you when you learn and you begin to learn and work with horses, you learn you learn a basic way of, of handling and relating. Okay. And without editorializing on it, all right, you learn that basic way of handling. And then at some point, you you start looking at that and you start saying, okay, this works. It may work badly, but it still works. You feel emotionally, you feel it's working. Mm -hmm. All right. One of the biggest problems you have with horses, uh, in case you haven't noticed, is horses are faster than you, stronger than you, and outweigh you. Oh, yes. Yes. So yeah. <laughs> on the physical level, okay, you are inferior. Intellectually, okay, I think that um, I am superior to the horse. In other words, I haven't caught my horse reading or writing. Yeah. But, you know, so, I mean, so th there's a certain, <clears throat> um, we could call, it could be arrogance, uh, but we could call it what, what we, it's an apparent difference. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And of course, our ego would say superiority. Right. Okay. Right. But let me take it from the horse's point of view. You're a crappy horse. <laughs> You're slow, <laughs> dim-witted. All right. You can't even get out of the way when monsters come. And God forbid the lions chase us. All right. What I like about you as a horse is that when the lions chase us, you're the one who's going to get eaten because you're the slow one. <laughs> <laughs> so from both you and the horse have in common a, a very important point, all right? And that is that I know I'm the center of the universe and you're not. Mm -hmm. And what's more important is that I live and the hell with you. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I'm more important than you are. I'm the center. Funny thing is, the horse thinks exactly the same thing. And both of us are right. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's where the harmony bit comes in, right? Right. Where, where we kind of meet in the middle on, right. on that. Yeah. But it, yeah. yeah, but it's on listening, not on telling. And the problem with listening and th within this metaphor, all right, is that it's not the ears, it's the emotional experience, it's the texture of it. And the reality of it is, do we have the mechanism to understand it? If we have a good education, what I would say is a, a superior equitation mm -hmm. experience and awareness enables you to make that connection on an authentic level. It's not an intellectual, it's authentic, okay? Mm -hmm. When somebody connects authentically, okay, really, truly, harmoniously and authentically connects with the horse, everybody goes, it's a horse master. Oh, look at the amazing miracle things. They're the horse whisperer, which is a term I absolutely despise, but never. <laughs> <laughs> and it was kind of a crappy book too, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, but you know, that, ability to make that connection what that how you know that guy might know something about horses is he's authenticated by the horse which means on the horse's level the horse might be thinking if it was like us it might be saying thinking something like yeah this guy gets it You're decent. Uh, yeah <laughs> you know yeah. whereas the one that's brutalizing the horse mm -hmm. okay uh, doesn't when i say they don't get it you know, but if you talk to that person that's brutalizing the horse, they think they get it. Yeah. You see, yeah. it's very difficult. And then it's like, well, why does one take one path or the other? And the combination of experience, you know, um, and the way that you frame the questions with the horse mm -hmm. okay, uh, yeah. is the problem. So every beginner, how does every beginner come to the horse? What's a beginner's mind? 
you're scared to death. If you're not scared to death, you're stupid. Yeah. However, what we'll do is be scared to death and we'll use two things, all right, at least to deal with that. We will use ignorance first and aggression second. Well, not necessarily the order, it doesn't matter, but ignorance and aggression. Oh my God, I'm afraid. So I'm going to ignore it. All right. So boy talk would be there, there, little man, be a, be a real man. Don't be afraid. Right. You're right. right? You know, mm -hmm. and when you don't know anything about horses, that could be quite stupid. Yeah. Okay. And then what you do is the way that you then proceed is you make a barrier emotionally through ignorance. And you use, in, you use your aggression to manipulate the situation. And I'd like to tell you that doesn't work, but it does work. So when you listen to beginner lessons, and the, the most difficult thing to teach is beginning steering, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. with somebody who really loves the horse. Because I, they, re yeah. <laughs> they refuse to do aggression. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Guilty. And then you have the other right, and yeah. then you have the other extreme, the guy, the guy or gal who does nothing but aggression. Mm -hmm. So if you listen to a beginning lesson, it'll be, don't allow him to do that. Make him go, kick him, kick him. You know, and it's like, okay, again, I like to say, well, that doesn't work. No, 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 it does work. But if your goal is to harmonize and become one with the horse. It doesn't work any more than instead of asking you out on a date, I come to your door, grab you, and force you into the car, <laughs> make you go to a movie. <laughs> right, right. And, and, you know? and, yeah, and it's a pretty decent analogy because you're getting the result. I'm there. Right. But am I happy about it? Right. Am I ever going to go out with again? Probably not. Or I'm going to be really, you know, maybe I'm wow. more you know, aggressive it, or nasty or fight back, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, so, yeah. Well, you see the possibility of all kinds yeah. of bizarre, uh, yeah. going in all kinds of bizarre directions. Exactly. The, rea the reality of it is, uh, I mean, based on my personal experience, all right, is that when I was working that way, there would be in me a discomfort with the aggression mm -hmm. that, if you and I were talking back in those days, I would never admit to. But, and, and maybe to some degree, it wasn't even verbalized. Maybe I didn't even know. Mm -hmm. But there's this kind of discomfort. Is, is this all there is to it? I'm a big, strong guy. I can make the horse do things. Ah, but now I want the horse to do something more and I can't get it. Well, you know, it, it so what that does is that discomfort throws me back on myself and I start thinking, why can't I get this? Especially when I think I'm a nice guy. Yeah. You know, I think I'm a nice guy and I think I love horses very much. How come I can't get everything from the horse? What, what stops the horse from giving me everything my heart desires? And the answer is me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. The problem's not in the horse. Exactly. And, and going way back to the beginning of this, the, when we were talking and you talked about, right, and we, we separate. And, and I think so many people are divorced from their emotions to begin with, right? right. And there was another thing that you said that I kind of had a little bit of a, a realization where, you know, when you're a beginner and you're terrified, right? And, and it's okay to say that a lot of times. I'm, you know, I'm scared right. or whatever, but there's a point kind of in your writing uh, journey um, where people are, you know, people assume, well, you're not a beginner anymore, therefore you should not be afraid. And right. I know I felt that pressure sometimes of, well, you know, I've been writing for, you know, X amount of years and, you right. know, blah, and I don't know, for whatever reason, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm feeling scared, right? Maybe even with my own horse, right. but we're not going to tell anybody that because, you know, what's wrong with you or what kind of writer are you, right? So there's almost like this um cultural pressure not well yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, and that's all this is again this is the complexities of uh, being human yeah 
you know, yeah. and the horse doesn't go into these, you know, we're talking about nuance on top of nuance of aggression and feeling. Right. And right. Horse doesn't go through that. That's real simple, cut and dry. Bum, bum, bum. Yeah. I, yeah. Know? Right. So, <laughs> so for us to be able, if we're going to penetrate into a, a deeper level of understanding, uh, uh, it has to be, um, if, if for one minute I had a button, I pushed it, and it, as if, uh, the, like the Star Trek transporter, mm -hmm, would occur, mm -hmm. it would take Betsy, the human, out of her physical body and inject it into a horse. And then you would actually have the experience of the horse. I bet your training and riding would be a lot different. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So here's, here's the issue, okay? Um, High-level training all right, allows both the horse and myself, using myself as an example, of course, to stand in equanimity with each other, mm -hmm. okay? And when I say equanimity, we both have an innate appreciation for our intelligence. And nature provides a hierarchy, okay, in which the horse will say, at some point through intelligent work with the horse, that the horse will recognize my superior intelligence. Not because I assert it because of aggression and not because of any effort I make, but who I am and how I appear over the course of time. The result is I'm predictably intelligent, okay? And, and because I have a willingness to uh, abandon or minimize my ignorance and aggression, the horse starts saying that they can talk to me. Okay, so racism enters into this because the issue is a racial issue. Okay, all the same problems are there. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. see, racism is occurs when one type <laughs> thinks right. they're superior to another type. Right, and so in this case, you would just take the race out and put the horse. Right. It's yeah. breed. Well, it, it is race. It's breed. Yeah. Species. You know, what's the difference yeah. between one race and the other? Breeding. What's yeah. the difference between a horse? Yeah. You know, and me. Breeding. You know? <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, my mother didn't look like a horse. Nor did my father. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So, you know, and so here's the issue is, the first thing is, how do you come when there's fear present? How do you eliminate fear? Fear is the enemy, mm -hmm. not the horse. And right. it first has to be, when I say eliminated, eliminate is a funny word here. All right. It's not a question of you blocking it and making it go away, but it's a pressure. It's, it's the ability to see what is mm -hmm. fear, F E A R, false expectation appear real. Right. Right. So like, like you, you, you know, and I think everybody listens knows that horses are vegetarians. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So when you're eating a hamburger and you're afraid that the horse is going to grab it and take it away from you and you're fearful of that, that's a false expectation appearing real yes. because the yeah. horse goes hamburger. Why would I put that in my mouth? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So <laughs> one of the things historically uh, that how do we get rid of fear? If you're afraid of me and I'm afraid of you, all right, one of the ways that we dissolve that fear is through language. Mm -hmm. When you and I speak a common language through an exchange of communicate through communicating an exchange of energy in that way enables us over time to come to a relationship, which we could call a friendship or uh, a romantic Mm -hmm. relationship but the relationship the quality and the depth can improve in the relationship so the solution to fear is language okay yep 
when you communicate with the horse and you're good, all right, you are creating between you and the horse language, you see? And I, I don't know if you've ever tried to speak Finnish or Russian. They make sounds with their, on uh, Chinese, any of, I've packed a lot of oh, languages. I, I, I took Chinese and that was, yeah. The, the they way make you sounds with mouth. their mouth. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, God didn't make those sounds. How can I? <laughs> yeah, and and you know it's funny because um, you so I took I took a Mandarin Chinese class at community <laughs> college, and it was the most horrible experience I ever had. Precisely for what you're talking about was I'm trying to move my mouth, and there's you know three different tones, and they mean different things, and right, and I and I can't do it, and then the teacher is getting angrier and angrier with me. <laughs> And, you know, and she's getting aggressive, right? You know, right. she's yelling at me and, I, and I, I, finally I'm just like, oh, you know, and, and it got so bad and this is a true story. Um, and I'm going to say this now, but I didn't trust her because I knew every time I was going to go to class, I was probably going to be penalized, right? And embarrassed. And I ended up dropping the class, right? Okay. Yeah. Now, change the word Chinese, call it dressage. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then instead of, dropping the class you decide you don't need the class yeah and you're going to speak chinese anyway <laughs> okay that's most writers yeah yeah and when they're not understanding their bizarre version of whatever chinese is <laughs> they get frustrated and pissed off because the damn chinamen don't understand it <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and it's, and it's crazy but it's just as so what has to happen in in in, in, in the establishment of the languages, there has to be a connection. And what that means is that there has to be a commonness of mind. Mm -hmm. In other words, when I make a sound, if we're doing it in a verbal language, all right, that sound has to mean the same thing and it has to be done the same way. So I can't substitute one sound for the other because <laughs> right. when I do, the focus changes. So with a horse, which is nonverbal, I mean, we could use sound, um, and there are people that like to go in that direction. But uh, based on the hardwiring of the brain of the horse, I believe, okay, um, is that the tactile level mm -hmm. and spatial level is where the horse communicates. And so now here you do have a problem that's very much like Chinese, all right? Most modern European languages, they're all phonetically based. Chinese uses pictograms. Right. Right. So pictures are the words, you see, instead of letters. And so there's no sound. Well, I don't know this, but, and I know that there's, a, they do have a phonetic version, but the fundamental classic Chinese is basically pictograms. Right. All right. Horses work on pictograms that are tied into feeling, mm -hmm. right, that are tied into sensation and space and the manipulation of space. To do this, if I say, here's a point, okay, so I, I make a, a sound or a gesture, the feeling, I create a feeling, okay, and now there's a second point, okay? That's the beginning of a conversation. But it's only a conversation if you and I jump to the points together. Right. When right. you keep staying on the same point that I started with and you don't travel with me. So on a level of touch, there's touching and non-touching. All right. And you have to know when you're touching and when you're not touching. And if I add a third point, we now have a conversation. We have a subject, a verb, and an object. Okay. <laughs> we have three points. That's, a, that's the beginning of a sentence. It's a very elementary sentence. Okay, everything has to be universally the same, but this one has no words. It only has touch. Mm -hmm. Or maybe more accurately to say spatial awareness, especially with a wild horse. Spatial yeah. awareness, so you can't get, forget touch, it ain't happening. Right, right, yeah. And <laughs> it's, it's, all, yeah. it's all spatial. Yeah. In which case, you would call it herding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we have three words, right? We have the three points. Okay, it's only a conversation if you participate. Okay. And your mind travels, regardless of what the subject, verb, and object are. 
as long as your mind and my mind are traveling on the, in the same three points, we have a sentence. Now, what happens when I speed up? Okay. Well, if you are clever like me, all right, you'll stay with me. Okay. But when you're a little slow, you may be on the first point and I'm on the third. If you're on the first point, you suddenly are justified in your fear. Right. Right. Because you don't know where the hell I went. And you don't understand the third point. Right. Well, right. And, know. And, and, you know, so what I'm saying to you on a very rudimentary basis is the first thing that you teach the loss is pay attention. Mm -hmm. Pay attention is not, doesn't have to have an object, but the object is touch. Right. So, now, when I say touch, I'm using the definition of the word touch to be not just physical. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like right now we're communicating on, uh, you know, through cyberspace. Right. We're not in touch. No, no. But we are. Yeah. yeah. We're not spatially. I can't reach out. I, uh, well, I could reach out and pet the screen, but I don't think it'll feel like you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But there's okay. a connection there, right? Right. Yeah. Right. And our, hopefully our minds are following <laughs> each other. Right. Okay. Right. And you'll notice that when they don't, a question will arise. Hmm. Okay, and that's because when I say to you, you missed the point, I don't mean that in the normal pejorative sense of the term. It means that our minds are no longer moving together, or I sense a discord, and that makes me come up with a question, or you sense a small amount of disconnect, and you come up with a question. And that's so that we can herd each other's minds in harmony. Okay. You see, and now we have human social interaction horse the herd thing all right both humans and horses are herd animals yeah yeah all right? both, yeah yeah i exactly. mean there are similarities there are dissimilarities all right but what we're, so what we need is this touch and that's the first that's the beginning of communication and so in the classical thinking uh, there there's three kinds of touch light gentle firm okay we have past present and future we can't, when I say we can't separate from that, I don't know, maybe we can, but you know, for most people, I think without getting real metaphysical, we can say, no, you can't separate from that. Okay, um, all right. So what happens is that we have to be, not only do we have to have the points, but we have to have the motion together, synchronicity, all right, across those three points to have communication occur. So without object, without making it a word or a particular thing, just presence creates this touch and that's the basis of the communication. We, the burden of our superior knowledge, us, all right, means that we cannot expect the horse to understand us without us understanding the horse. So in other words, the point, like if, if I'm talking to you and you're an idiot, the fact that you can't follow my three points and stay with me, all right, is not an excuse for me to beat you up and then hope you follow the three points that I don't know, you, do you not understand? You don't even know where the hell they are. Right, right. Because you haven't seen me as an idiot, <laughs> right? I mean, right. so it kind of comes And it's to whether or not we put the pejorative title or not is irrelevant. Sure. Right, right. No, but, okay. but yeah, but my, but, but it makes a good point, right? I mean, we can say, maybe, you know, I'm from outer space or something, but yeah, yeah. You no, know, it's so different, but there's no recognition that, right. yeah. So the goal, the first goal is connection. And that's either done through harmony or disharmony. Okay. And the time, the amount of time it takes to pass from one thing to the other, mm -hmm. all right? Um, has to, we both have to be able to be within that timing, okay? So in, in if you are a um, non-native speaker in English, one of the difficulties in, in, in it is timing. So 
like, like I understand French, but conversational French, my brain can't keep up with it. And that's because I translate it. Mm. See, the timing, I can't keep up with the timing. Right. So one of the problems in the training of the horse is this element of timing, because at each step, the horse's mind has to stay with you, which means that in dealing with the horse, you have to be within the same psychological time zone that the horse is. And because we are smarter, i.e. quicker intellectually, mm -hmm. we have to slow our whole process down intellectually and emotionally to make sure that we keep the connection. Because from the horse's point of view, who the hell are you, human? Why the hell do I want to connect with you? You just seem like a, a nuisance. Not only a, 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 are you not aware of the harmony that's important from the horse's point of view, okay? But uh, you act like a crazy being. You do things for no reason. Why should I not be afraid? You know, you're acting like a crazy being. Now, from right. a human point of view, you say, well, this is the way horse people act. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is, this is I'm, I'm getting to, I hope to God, <laughs> a reason why the old equitation, um, the value of the old equitation and the modern thing, okay? One of the problems is that language, the language that we instinctively use is far too fast for the horse. And culturally, okay, we are, um, if this will seem like I jumped to the side and I'm dealing with another issue maybe, but I'm not, it's the same idea. If we look at music and we look at the development of music, uh, we can see that there's been a change in music. Music before the Industrial Revolution was very harmoniously, the intervals were very prescribed. It was all based on different kinds of harmony. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The rhythms naturally tied into the earth. There was nothing artificial about it. The sun came up, it went down. There were these natural rhythms. The fastest tempo it would be running water, possibly, mm -hmm. but relative to the animal world, be the sound of a horse running. Okay. Those yeah. are the fastest kinds of rhythms, but human rhythms, the way we relate to all the time, was very different. We were in a natural progression. So in the old music, you know, it would follow who we are. Then look at the Industrial Revolution. We go from tempos that were um, based on roughly, right, and arguably, 4-4 um, four, four time is the time that applies to horses and to us to some degree. All right, why? Because, all right, you have, I don't know, oops, you're trying to talk to me. Ah, there it is. Okay, let's do it. Four, four stages. Now, right. it could be done in three. So if I said to you, okay, Betsy, get out your um, guitar, your violin, your fiddle, whatever you play. I say, we're going to make music together. And I start playing. It's like, whoa, wait. So if we're going to play together, all right, we have to have a common song. That means that there has to be a rhythm and a cadence in it. And we're going to start. So what I'm going to do, or you would do, one of the two of us is going to have to do one and a two and Right, right. So if you look at one and uh, two, it's actually three. Right. right. <laughs> so yeah. the timing for the horse is four, four time, the walk, three, four time, the canter, two, four time, the trot. How do I know that? Those are the footfalls. You can hear it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. <clears throat> and music, if I said to you, okay, I'm going to do a song, da, da, da. Da, 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 da. What's wrong with that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> the timing's not regular. It's right. irregular. Right. right. So I was saying to you, one of the things that an English speaker, one of the most difficult things when someone's learning English, when I say something, like, what'd you say? Okay. If you don't speak English, that doesn't make any sense. But as an English speaker, you slow me down in your head. What? did you say 
what a non-English speaker hears is what you say. One word. Right, right. You see, what's happened is you put the spaces in, in your head. So when I say, what do you say? Automatically, your brain inserts the spaces. Mm -hmm. This is not an automatic process. This is why you start with horses, lunging horses, if the lunging is well done, mm -hmm. then educated. What you work at is to perfect the interval between the footfalls okay. so that they are regular. Now we have the basis of a language. You see, and the difference between music, which is something that we are doing together, or it can be something I'm doing internally, all right, depends on that. So like when I speak to you in normal conversations, if we did it musically, it's Whereas a song would be in other words, it stays within a certain range. It's uniform. The intervals are the same. Even if there's a rest in, one of the things that's stimulating is that when you give a, a rest, you automatically will put the extra beat in. So when I say to you, the, the, the canter's a three beat, it's one, two, three, pause, one, two, three, pause, one, two, three, pause. So it's actually four. Right. Except right. it really isn't a beat. Yeah. Yeah. So the regularity is what makes the work good. And the tempo is what communicates it. So if I talk to you in a slow, melodic, soft voice, it has a very different, and if I increase my volume, the emotional content changes. Yeah. And it also, even as you're doing that, like I'm aware of different emotional feelings that I'm having. Right. So, right. you know, when you're talking more melodiously, like I'm paying more attention and when it becomes more dissonant, you know, there's almost like an irritation that kind of, you know, or, or a detachment, like, Oh, what's going on here. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. But you see, so, like when you're working with a horse, you don't think about this, but this is no. the old riding. <laughs> Pre-industrial revolution and music, you can see it. What you get after the industrial revolution is you start getting, instead of this regularity of beat, you start getting boom chicka chicka boom chicka chicka boom chicka ching ding boom chicka chicka boom Yeah. What is that? That's a machine. I was just going to say that's machine stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's vast. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's syncopated. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but the, within the tones, the sound could be sharp or it could be harsh. Yeah. And so what yeah. you see is the development of modern music. You start seeing jazz, rap. Okay. And, and yeah. this is not to put those things down. Right. But we're talking about horses. Exactly. And they, they're not, they didn't have an industrial revolution. <laughs> right. And yeah. they, don't, they don't understand rap. Right. Right. But they do understand the feeling of a rhythm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in the 18th century, there was, and 17th century, there was at times a pride with how slow things went. Mm -hmm. All right. Not so when you get to the 19th century, what you start getting is military equitation. And in military equitation, if you go that slow, the damn war is over, won and lost before you even got the horse to the front lines. Right, right. So time became a premium. I had to get the horse, and this is natural, the natural horsemanship, um, you know, uh, oh, in a matter of hours, you can get on the horse. And it's like, and why would you do that? What are you, this is the same analogy as the drinking analogy? Yes. You yeah. know, oh, it's a $1,000 bottle. God, I got it done in under five minutes. Wow. You must be a superior drinker. <laughs> well, you know? You know, yeah, and it's it's really funny too because I um, I had this conversation, uh, I'm, and I'm not going to say with who because I don't I don't want the person to be upset with me. But you know, it, I want to have a relationship with a horse. The horse, you know, relationship with a horse is the most important thing. And come to the barn. Why am I not having a relationship with a horse? And right. I point out, will you come one hour once a week? 
and right. come in and you're like, I'm going to have a relationship with you. Right. You know, and, yeah. and it's that speed, right. It's that expectation of speed. Um, yeah. You know, that's not, not going to work. Right. Well, and the tempo of our lives all right, is very different. And how do you know that? That's why I went to the music thing. The way that music expresses itself. All right. The feeling of the music is an ex the reason it's such an interesting thing is because it correlates with our emotions. Yeah. I mean, why do you like a song? It, it, or a melody, it connects to you. You connect to the harmony and the beat that's involved in it. I mean, even if it is rap. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, but, yeah, yeah, but it creates, it creates a feeling. And, right. and I would say from a, so in essence, then there's a, there's a creation of a music that you want to create with a horse via right. kind of your emotion and the spatial, you know, and the touch that's, they can harmonize too, right? So, right. you know, because if I'm coming up, I mean, you know, you see people, you know, they're, they're doing the same thing over and over again. You know, I know I've gotten the, you know, buzz buzz about tapping too much with a whip, right? Because it just dulls, um, you know, dulls or irritates, right? So it's not, it's like figuring that out, that, that kind of music between you and the horse, right? In a slower way. Yeah, and it's, it, it's, what matters, you see, when we talk about it with humans and between you and I, whatever tempo, when we go and enter into a conversation or a relationship, we have a sense because we are people of our time. Right, right. Okay, if I were a 16th century uh, nobleman, mm -hmm. he would find, uh, it would find you very weird and all these moderns weird. Yes. You know, they're yes. just kind of out of sync with everything. Mm -hmm. And you would find the same thing of that nobleman. You'd say, oh, God, he's out of sync. God, what a weird, weird ass guy that guy is. <laughs> you see, now, I would say, thankfully, we don't deal with that. But with the horse, we are dealing with that because the horse, we have to adjust all our rhythms, all our timing. All of this has to be adjusted to the horse. That's the burden of our superior intelligence. Instead, what most of us, most of the time, totally unintentionally do is we assume that our tempo, our timing is the right tempo, it's the right timing, and why doesn't the horse understand us? Right. Because right. it's on the horse to understand us. Why? Yeah. Because we're the center of the universe. Uh, you know, well, the horse thinks the same thing. So, and does the horse need us? No. We yeah. want to have a relationship with the horse. So we're the one who has to adjust our timing. All right. On yeah. a physical level. All right. Our heartbeat roughly, give or take, uh, there's variations, there's a range, but we usually say around 78 beats a minute. All right. At rest. Horses usually function at about 36. Okay. You, that means that from the horse's perspective, we're like a fly. Zip, 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 zip. And that can be that can be very agitating. Right? Well, it, again, you're out of rhythm. You're not you're not in harmony. So what I have to do is I have to make a conscious, deliberate effort to slow myself down, so that I can get into the time of the horse. Okay. Now, the issue then is uh, is about educating and listening, so that you know what that time is. I mean, I'm doing it on the basis of physiology. I'm saying heart rate. Right. You know, right. Um, what's interesting is you notice that everybody obsesses on trotting. Yeah. You know, that the way to work the horse is trotting. Why? Because that's our normal rate. In other words, I'm saying 78 beats a minute. If you, if you evaluate what happens with the horse as the horse starts to pick up its rate, when the horse gets to around 78 beats a a minute or normal 78 beats a minute when it gets to the horse is trotting interesting so the horse is following our heart rate interesting so they not only that right but what happens when i make a sound and i do this one two one two one two one two one you what you'll notice is that <laughs> your brain <laughs> starts doing this yeah. And yeah. if I slow it down, what, what happens if I slow it down a little bit? 
It's called hypnosis. Mm -hmm. Okay. You become, to use the old word, mesmerized. Right. right. So when I'm trotting, okay, um, if the horse dropped dead, would most riders know it? <laughs> That's you know, a good question. Yeah. No, but, but, but you see, what I'm saying is, is that you become yeah. mesmerized by it. And yeah. so that through a whole a whole session in riding, are you connecting to the horse? We know you're mesmerized. Right. We know you think right. you are. Right. In fact, are you and the horse on the same page? Okay. This is one of the things about the aids, and this is one of the things about timing. But all right, so like um you're you're a young girl, you've never danced with a boy before. I come over and ask you to dance. <sighs> you're feeling because you don't know what it oh, you know like you're supposed to do it, but it's like oh god. It's a little, it, well, yeah, and in, in, you know, and in a sense, right? It's like for a beginner, the first time when they ride a horse, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You don't, and so, what happens when you become fearful? If you're afraid that if I had a hot poke in my hand, you're afraid I'm going to touch you, what do you do? Well, Every muscle in your body <laughs> tightens. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Every muscle in your body tightens. Yeah. What also happens is you can't feel. Okay. Well, if you can't feel, how do you know that you're in the right time with the horse? Right. Right. You see, so the issue starts to become one of relaxation you see the primitive trainer that we talked about in the beginning yeah yeah right? for motion to occur symmetrically like we laid it out requires not tension but an alternation between contraction and relaxation that first trainer we were talking about knows how to make the contraction part work very well Mm -hmm. He's clueless about the relaxation part. That nice, airy, fairy, uh, uh, being nice to my heart, also has the same issue. But all they understand is the relaxation part. Right. Yeah. Good movement is an alternation between the two. It is much easier to train tension, and it's quicker than it is to try to get relaxation. To get you to dance well with me when I ask you the first time, you're going to be awkward, having difficulty finding the music, not because you're not necessarily musical, but because your tension, your anxiety, makes it extremely difficult for you to maintain a rhythm and a cadence. Well, if I can't do that, I can't sing to the horse metaphorically. I can't engage the horse in our mutual music right, right and when our music doesn't agree when music doesn't follow the square scale we no longer have harmony we have dissonance and th and that's where then we start you know spiraling off into fear and anger and right. arguments and blah right. Blah, 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 blah right uh, yeah so. so the essence of classical training and good training in the horse is to train the horse in relaxation. So I can do a lot of things with you, Betsy, but one of the things I can't do is I can't make you relax. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, you can't. Yeah. So I can create relaxation and an environment right. of relaxation, but I can't make you relax. So in the case of, you know, because I mean, obviously you do a lot of clinics, right? And you're, you're, you, you've taught tons of people, um, you know, in the last 50 years. So if I'm watching this, right, and I'm saying, oh, my God, I, wow, I've just had this epiphany, you know, I'm, I'm coming in with these expectations, or I'm, you know, I'm like this all the time, or whatever, and you're telling me, okay, I need to slow it down. Um, what kind of, uh, you know, if there are any um, practical, like, like, what could I do uh, to do that, right? You know, you know, starting from walking in the barn or grooming my horse or, you know, or even in the middle of a riding session, like what, what would you normally, right. yeah. This is, <sighs> this is um, the essence of the issue and the essence of the problem. <laughs> right. Okay? And one of the problems, one of the reasons that this will be hard for you to discover is because it'll appear you're not doing anything. 
<laughs> and that's why I asked this question because I knew you were going to say that answer because that was the next thing that I was going to say is people are impatient, right? I mean, I, I am, you know, as, as we're talking about this, I'm thinking, well, there's going to be a lot of people who are like, I don't have time for, I mean, the first thing is, I, I don't have time it. for this, right? And that's go, exactly I, the point. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly because it, and it's not a question of volition. You see that when you say I don't have time for it, what what you, are you saying to the horse? Is you're saying that your cadence is wrong. You have to come up to mine. If you don't come up to mine, I'm going to be pissed off at you. Right. And where where the horse is thinking something like, God, you know, for me to come to that level, I have to be uh, crazy. Mm -hmm. And some horses accommodate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. think about, I mean, there's two kinds of horses, basically, that you're dealing with. One is dead from the neck up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the horse that says, I don't care what you do, you and do it. Leave me alone. Oh, what? You want something? Uh, and then you use, when the aggression gets to a certain level, the horse says, oh, it's okay. And this is why also you don't keep doing something with the whip like that, because it normalizes it. And then, but it doesn't have to. Right. Okay. But the, the common understanding will be it normalizes you're making it dead so it won't work. Right. All right. So what you're doing is you're going to the, 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 the horse that's absolutely dead from the neck up and, you know, uh, kick him because he won't move. Give it an option. He'll stand in the center of the ring. He won't go anywhere. Yeah. And then the other kind of horse is equivalent to the hysterical. Yes. Yeah. So what's the difference between the two? All right. The timing. In both cases, you're not in the right time. Mm -hmm. All yeah. right. So how do you get there? All right. All right. Well, you, the horse has to like you. <laughs> That's a good place to start. Uh, yeah. yeah. You think? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yet nobody does this. What you need to do is pet the horse. That's where it starts. Petting the horse. Isn't that ridiculous? Because you'll go like you'll say, okay. All right, so pet the horse. Okay, I petted it. How come I don't have it? Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Okay. Because it's just one more thing, right? It's not. Right, you know. because you're going to jump from point A to point B. And again, we're saying it's a tactile language. So what do you do? Like if I, if I came over and I put my hand on your shoulder, okay? I mean, there's all kinds of cultural things that are involved in that. But what would the first reaction might be startled. And yeah. you harden up. Yeah. And I and if I'm mindful, I can feel you harden up. And of course, assuming that I'm not talking to you, because I would use as a primary, I would not use touch. I would use words. Right. right. But, but taking on a tactile level, what would I do? See, I'd start massaging. Mm -hmm. All right. And then if you're very gentle and you're very careful in the way that you massage, what I'll feel is I'll feel the tension leave. Yeah. Okay. So when I say this to you, you say, oh, well, that makes perfect sense. Good. Now, what does it feel like in the horse? See, it takes a lot, actually a lot of listening. And you'll get a good student will pet the horse. <laughs> that's not what you want. What you want is, oh, 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 yeah. No, over here. Yeah. Yeah. So what that means is the horse has taken you from point one to point two. You're in the conversation. Right, because now they're they're responding. Yeah, and, you know, yeah, yeah. And it's funny when you say this too, because like you know, little girls, you know, and they love to love on horses and pet them and rate, and those horses will pretty much do anything for them. And and right. and, and that's probably the same thing, right? Energetically, yeah. they're really harmonizing and and in, like loving and liking that horse and and being likable versus I'm doing. So this yeah, <laughs> you're, you're getting the point in the sense that I could say, ah, yes, she understands. Ah, you understand. We agree. We are synchronized. We're in harmony. We understand. This is human understanding. Right, right. Yeah. What is, how does this work out for the horse? And that's, the, and that's it's the horse. not, yeah. even when I feel the relaxation. If I'm going to convert that into motion, there has to be a tension and then there has to be a relaxation. And right. the gap between the tension and the relaxation has to be uniform. Because if it's not, it causes emotional agitation. You're no longer singing to the horse. Right, right. So yeah. when I sing to the horse, and I, it actually literally could be, 
But mm-hmm. it, when I sing to the horse on a tactile level, mm-hmm. it's establishing a rhythm. Not my version. <laughs> right, right. But their version. Right. Yeah. So like when I go and I, I, if you watch, and I don't know if this is, well, when I start working with a horse, the first thing I do is I pet the horse. Mm-hmm. But it's not this mechanical, oh, one, two, three, I petted the horse. Right, right. I have to see, feel the response. I say to the horse with my touch, I am here. Mm-hmm. The horse, by relaxing and acknowledging me through its body, its eye, the way it handles itself, and my tactile awareness, tells me when the horse is with me. Now, on a crude level, you'll see the horse will turn and look at you, he'll relax and come into a, you know, show you the same way I would if non-verbally, if you, if you start giving me a massage and you're doing it well. <sighs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So yep. now once you have that, you now move from the first touch of, Oh my God, who are you? And what the hell do you want to, right. Oh, this isn't so bad. Okay. And now give up on the touch. And if you've done the touch part well, the horse will say, where'd you go? Come back. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. Wait, you can do more. And so then you come back and then you go away. Okay. This is very simple. This becomes the AIDS. Right. Because it's that Um, gap. And there's that gap that we're talking about between the word and the music. Yeah. So the question Mm -hmm. isn't how do you do it? The real question is, how do you link mm-hmm. two minds together? Yeah, yeah. So the linking becomes the issue, not the appearance. All right, not the alternating in between you and the horse's contraction and relaxation, but the development of congruence mm-hmm. between you and the horse. Okay. Congruent action, emotionally, because that's where the horses are at. Contraction, relaxation, contraction, that's what, that's motion. Again, we already know that it's framed in a 4-4 time, but that we can run in 4-4, 3-4, or 2-4, but the common underlying thing is the four-beaded aspect of it, that there's four legs. Mm-hmm. We have to get harmonious, and we have to link. We can only link to commonality. Commonality occurs, all right, in one place, always. And that's in gravity. It's in earth. Mm -hmm. Okay? In other words, when I'm standing upright, the mechanism that I use to do is exactly the same for the horse. In other words, what we have to do is align our physical being with the earth, the center of the earth. How do I know when I do that? I don't fall over. <laughs> yes, well, yeah, there's All that. Right. Yeah. When it's done well, okay, I'm symmetrical in my alignment. Mm-hmm. If I leave, if I'm like this, I can do this. Right. But it'll become physically exhausting. And if I practice it, I can eventually maybe make it to where this becomes reasonably comfortable. You see? Yeah. But if if I'm gonna have duration meaning that I'm going to use this body and I'm not going to wear out one side more than the other. I want to be upright and I want to be perpendicular to the earth. So it both starts with you being in touch with the earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So from earth, which is a pure physical mechanical alignment, the next thing is required is feeling. Why do horses move? And the answer is really stupid because they feel like it. Right, right. Okay, all emotion is exactly that. E, energy, in motion. Right, right. The only reason a horse moves is because it feels like it. You know, now, so the idea, if you want an upper level horse, a highly trained horse, it can only occur when the horse feels like it. Yeah, and that and they have that emotion to right, to do that. Yeah, right. 
And so what there has to be is enough synchronicity and harmony and a feeling of harmony between yourself and the horse, a connection where when you feel like it, in other words, when I turn to the horse to the left, how does the horse know I want to do a left turn? It feels like it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's where, yeah. Yeah. What happens when the horse feeling. is going to the right? They feel it's like either it. Not synchronous <laughs> or it's acting in opposition. Right. All right. Whether the opposition is actually physical or mental. In other words, if I told you that if you do um, a certain procedure, you go A, B, C, it'll always result in a right turn. And so being obedient, you do the ABC and you get a left turn. Mm -hmm. So either, all right, that's the wrong sequence. Right, right. Or the horse is acting in discord. And if it's acting in discord, why would it do that? So where would you find common ground? So what we know is the earth is now wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm going that way and the horse is going, going the way. other way. Yeah. Yeah. So the first thing I have to do is stop motion, mm -hmm. line up, link, make our earth common. Yep. Yep. And then elicit emotion. How do you elicit emotion? Through feeling, through stimulation. See, if I give you a massage, it feels good. Yeah. yeah. All right. So that might lead one to think that in being awake for 12 hours, you need to be constantly massaged. <laughs> There's actually a level yeah. of truth to it, but it's not on the physical level. Right. Because okay? right. if yeah. I massage you for 12 hours, uh, pro my guess would be after about an hour, and maybe if you're really tenacious, maybe you might handle two, it won't feel so good. You'll say, yeah. leave me yeah. alone. Give me a yeah. break. And there's a limit to it. Yeah. So yeah. what's important in speech and in communication is not only what's said, but the space in between. Mm -hmm. And when we're synchronized, we agree on the commonality of the space in between. So I, 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 I think we're up in the clouds of theory here. This is eminently yeah. practical. Yes, it's eminently practical, because, but it is so rudimentary that unless somebody who understands this is standing there holding your hand, you might not be able to get the thing to work because you, you'll do it, you know, for if you're dealing with a really disturbed horse, you may do it for three or four weeks or more yeah. before the horse starts to appear to come around right all right, right to you yeah. because the horse has been so traumatized from people using fear and aggression like the most common way of managing the horse is through fear and aggression yeah and okay. that's what they expect military okay. riding favors mm -hmm. this because time is of essence right. right the old masters i hate that metaphor in a lot of ways but the old masters took the time yeah. And yeah. it's, where does it occur in one step? Mm -hmm. Like from, well, I have a student I've been teaching. Um, well, you know, Suzanne, I've been teaching her for about 16 years or 17 years. Or more, right. A yeah. long time. And one of the things she's relatively recently in the past year or two have said to me is she's noticing how mentally taxing it is to work at this simple level. Well, yeah, and I, I, I can tell you that, I mean, I've had those experiences too, right? Um, because when you have to be that present, um, it's exhausting, right? Well, not only that, but it opens up time. It does, yeah. In a it really interesting up. way. Yeah. yeah. Time yeah. expands itself. So here's a classic example. I teach, I'm in a clinic, I'm teaching a beginner candidate part. So I, I'll say something like, it doesn't have to be this outside leg back, you know, squeeze with both legs, give with a hand, horse canters. Right. Okay, right. so, boom, he has to begin to do it. All right, didn't happen. What didn't happen? Didn't, the horse didn't produce the canter. Okay, so we do it again. And then, oh, the horse produced the canter. What was the difference? All right, the beginner's perception on it is, 
Here I was at whatever Walker trial, and now I'm cantering. What happened in the gap? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, as an expert, this is what's happening in the gap. Okay. I feel the weight, and we'll talk about a left lead. I feel the I feel that the weight, I put the weight on the left front leg first. I then shift it across the diagonal to the right rear. Okay. I close my outside hand to block the right shoulder. I use the inside leg impulsively and the inside rein and give. Okay. That's a feeling of a shift of weight and right. Yeah. And when the horse doesn't canter, you ask the beginner, the beginner looks confused. I don't know what didn't canter. I can tell you, well, the horse didn't really shift the weight back fully or, you know, the horse did a sudden double step or something like that in between mm -hmm. and the horse didn't canter or it wouldn't present the step forward. And I know exactly what limb and where it was. And then because I know what I'm doing, supposedly, okay, <laughs> uh, I then look and say, eh, I should have known that. I, you know, it makes me feel a little stupid. It's like, yeah, I, you know, but I thought I could pull it off. It was almost where it should be, but it wasn't quite. And I, the only reason I knew it wasn't quite is because I could feel it. Why did I do all that feeling? And why does the beginner go, ah, oh, you know, and is surprised. And it's like, this is whole world in between of these weight shifts and that, that and intellectually you can get it but that's not the same as feeling it yeah yeah and and that brings up a a, a very interesting point too because um and maybe i'm connecting two wrong things but um there's that gap that there's a there's a specific like richness to that feeling like i know i'm gonna get the trot or the canter part because they're ready and i can feel it exactly versus it's not as much as i position aids whatever it's not gonna happen right, right. and it doesn't happen so um, yeah <clears throat> and unlike a, a recipe you see when i get a recipe and i have the mix i i measure a cup of water i throw it in I stir it up, I stick it in the oven. Oh, look, I got a cake. Right, yeah. <laughs> okay, it's not a recipe. So what the beginner will do is turn to me as the instructor and say, well, it didn't happen. I did the recipe. Yeah. It didn't happen. Okay, well, that's because you used the wrong ingredients. Mm. Ah, mm. How did I get the wrong ingredients? It's the texture of the AIDS and the timing of the AIDS because it's not a cake. It was a cake. All you had to do is add the water, put it in the oven, and it happens. And it'll always come out that way. Like, well, yeah. And, you know, it was, uh, to do an analogy that I think a lot of people can relate to, I, I had a manager that was reporting to me, and she was young. And she called me up. She was very frustrated. She said, you know, my employees, Lola. And I'm like, well, what? And she's like, well, I read this management book, and I'm doing the things that's saying in the management book, and it's not working. <laughs> And I said, well, you know, so-and-so, um, I'm pretty sure that everybody has probably read that management book or they know exactly <laughs> what you're doing because there was no, there was no authenticity to it, right? They knew right. she was going through the motions and she didn't really care, right? Um, yeah, so it's kind of like well, the same thing, right? <clears throat> and exactly, in, in business as well as in writing, what makes it work or not work is not the information. Yeah. It's the underlying feeling and the connection. Right. So yeah. like if I, if you and I have this warm feeling of connection, when things come up, we work through it. Exactly. But if you don't have the connection, we're not left with the mechanism to be able to do that. Right. Right. Sure. And, yeah. and <clears throat> when, like, as, when I, when I'm doing, I know that I'm speaking truth to the situation, but when I put myself in the listener's point of view, I don't know how the hell to do it without the horse being present. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I can explain the ideas and some people out there will hear the idea and they'll connect. Right. A lot right. of people hear the idea. The idea may be eloquently put, properly said, and they still can't connect on it. Okay. Yeah. For whatever the reason, and there's lots of reasons, potential, because we're complex beings. Right. Right. Okay. So most of the writing you want to do advanced riding and you really want to do high level stuff. 
It's only in the perfection of the basics that that can occur. That yeah. advanced writing is just basic writing done very well. All right, but there's a lot of social pressure, even if it's not from our society, even within ourselves, to perform. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. not to be, not to harmonize, to perform. And performance is, is rated well above everything else. Yeah. You yeah. see, it doesn't matter if you're miserable as long as you make your, your million billion dollars. You uh, see, because yeah. that's the point. <laughs> Okay. And the, yeah, and the reason why I'm having that reaction is I was just having this conversation this morning on this topic, and uh, it's contagious. Yeah, it is, yes. <laughs> it's something going around. Yeah, yeah. You know, but but you know, you and then you can see um, in simple cultures, in primitive cultures, a tremendous amount of joy in yeah. the community. You yeah. know, and it, it's it's because. The emotional connectedness part is working. Most of what's wrong is that we are up in our heads. We lose the, the emotional, physical connection. Then when we ride, we get pissed off because we don't have the emotional, physical connection in ourselves. And damned if we can't, we can't get it in the horse either. And right. the horse is just telling us, if I could speak for the horse, the horse is saying, look, you're not mentally, emotionally connected. What do you think when you meet somebody who isn't physically and emotionally connected, right? You're, and you're scared of, they make you nervous. Yeah. They yeah. really don't, they're, they're incompetent in a very peculiar way yeah. and you don't know which way it's going to go. So the horse doesn't have the intellect to realize that's what's going on. All they know is they know you're not connected. Yeah. And whatever it is you're doing, it isn't a connected thing. So the word we would use here and you have used is authentic. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, um, right. Yeah. It's, it's the only, it's the only word I really can think of. And, you know, it's funny cause you mentioned the word joy and that, that socialness. And I, um, it was, I was, uh, uh, with, uh, another uh, person who's a writer and she was talking about joy right so when you're riding make it joyful right and then you know the horse was like doing this very beautiful pee off but it was like bringing up eliciting that feeling of joy right to you know versus the aids of making it happen right um and it was kind of very interesting um that that perspective um you know and just having fun um versus you know making or mechanically doing things right well let me share let me share something that's um it's not in english it's only in french and it's mm -hmm. uh, um it's something from a um uh, one of the the, the what an arguably uh, one of the people said one of the greatest masters that ever lived was a guy by the name of Baudant. now Baudant is not well known and one of the reasons Baudant is not well known is because of the um the convergence of the second world war <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Okay, so uh, people were a little preoccupied with other things other than riding horses. <laughs> yeah, in the maybe a little. Yeah, they were a little distracted. <laughs> yeah, okay. but here's what Bogdan said. Uh, he was talking to a, one of his students, his, uh, a, a senior student. He said, "When you do the movement, okay, when you do this movement, he was working. I think he was working in Piaf or Passage. He was, but he says um, um, you have to sing." Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You must sing. He says, I don't mean hum. I mean sing the words to a song. When you're writing what I think it was the passage, when you're writing the passage. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I, I don't remember exactly whether it was or wasn't, but it applies on anything. You have to sing the song. And I don't need to hear it, it's not outside. You're to sing it in your head and don't hum it in your head. Sing the words. Okay. He did that and he's able to get perfect rhythm and harmony. Why? Why does it work that way? Okay. Because the words occupies your brain. Mm-hmm. And the only thing that comes through is your intellect is too busy singing the stupid words. And you don't even, they don't even have to be the words to the song. 
Right. So right. when I write, I can write the movement. Okay. It eliminates the rational mind. And in the music, you become entrained, carried along by the feeling. Yeah. Which is all the horse cares about. Yeah. And then you're in harmonizing, right? Because exactly right. On, on, yeah. On that. And, and he yeah. said, and Bodan said, you know, you ha he, he says, listen to me in this, you know, sing, you must sing. He says, but uh, nobody, it doesn't matter if you're not a good singer, you don't sing out loud. Mm. Okay. Uh, another interesting aside, there was a period in the 16th century and early 17th century, where it was very, it was very um, um, fashionable to sing to your horse. Oh, really? Yeah. One of the huh. things about Henry VIII, okay, is they said he had a beautiful voice when he sang to his horse. Wow. So wow. they would be riding along singing to their horse. Wow. But you in harmony. So actually, in some way, somebody might play with that a little bit and find that if you're doing the shoulder in and you're getting stuck, yeah, it may not be the, the end all to it, but it is a simple, relatively simple thing. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and one of the things also about Bodant, and I don't know the name of the illness that he had, but I can describe it to you. What happens is the perio sternum uh, pulls away from the bone and it's, it causes excruciating pain. And he was absolutely physically incapable of riding with any kind of physical force. Mm -hmm. He was weak. All right. And yet he could do things like flying changes a lead every stride while cantering backwards. Wow. Wow. And that's coming from. Right. Yeah. Right. It's <laughs> coming out of the harmony and the linking in gentleness. You see, because why do why do, why do people like to dance? It's yeah. it's exactly the same thing. <laughs> so does the horse. Yeah. Because yeah. this feelings of congruent movement with somebody else, with another being. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. I've I've had like the briefest, but yeah, it's that addicting that's it's a totally addicting feeling. So Craig, I'm gonna ask you a question. Yes. Um, and I ask every guest this question. So in your experience, you know, when was your, like, what was one of your biggest aha moments with the horse? And I mean, that might be a tough one for you because I, I know you probably have. Um, well, because it's an ongoing thing. Mm -hmm. the, the, the biggest, the biggest aha is the one I'm going through right now. <laughs> Which is, but I'm always going through it. Yeah. So it, yeah. You know, it's, it's um, I want to say, it's not daily, but it's um, weekly, monthly. Mm -hmm. I, I can't really schedule it, <laughs> you know, but there seems yeah. to be um, inner wisdom that's there. Mm -hmm. And it's an ongoing thing. And the biggest aha uh -huh is discovering linking, mm -hmm. the conception mm -hmm. of linking. That's probably one of the biggest ones. And that understanding that it's a multidimensional phenomenon. Mm -hmm. In other words, what that congruence and connection feels like, what it is. It's like suddenly all the training I had suddenly made sense. Whereas before yes. it was um, a recipe that I was following. As soon as I understood congruence and I could find the congruence and the harmony, then the aids were no longer theoretical. Hmm. It wasn't like, oh, well, you can think that it's this or that. No. There is no rotting that isn't grounded in congruence. If it isn't grounded in congruence, it's useless. I'm using the word congruent like it's a common word. Um, congruent means uh, harmony. Right. In, yeah. in, in, in congruence, we talk about congruent triangles. If I do a triangle here, then there's another, because it's a geometry kind of word. That's right. where most people have heard it. And then there's another triangle when they're congruent. If you laid one, it would rest exactly on top of the other one. Right, which is hard. The space would be very different, and you'd look at it, and you might think, oh, are they congruent? And one of the things about, one of the proofs in geometry is how do you prove congruence in? Uh, and congruence means that it's in harmony with things. And congruence mm -hmm. is probably the, that understanding of congruence, because 
it's in the literature, mm -hmm. but nobody tells you how. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. a lot of what yeah. we spend our time with is me as an instructor is trying to get you to experience congruence. Yeah, and it's it's trying to explain an essence, right? Yeah. You, know, you can't yeah. you can't verbalize an essence to something or a harmony because my harmony right. feels different to me than it would to you, right? right? And everybody yeah. knows yeah. harmony, right? Right. Even yeah. even though they have no formal training, yeah, congruence yeah. is the same way. Yeah. It's like when you watch me ride. If you it, uh, we're going to assume uh, a high degree of perfection, which may or may not exist. <laughs> okay. But for a moment, let's say that, uh, that I am really brilliant at that. When you come and you watch me, whether you're an expert or a beginner, what strikes you is the congruence. Yeah. Yeah. And when you feel the congruence, you know that you're seeing a good rider. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and sometimes, um, cause in, in, the um, United States and Northern Europe, I think, it, riding is, a, there's a lot of girls, a lot of women that are involved in, in riding, okay? Um, um, you know, it, 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 uh, it's the feeling of harmony, okay? And everybody more or less knows what that feels like, whether they technically appreciate it or not. And one of the things about the congruence is that you, the, uh, a, girl, a, a woman will bring a guy to their boyfriend to the barn, mm -hmm. okay, and the boyfriend or a horse show, mm -hmm. and the boyfriend will know what good riding is and what bad riding is, even though they yeah. technically don't know a thing. I, I have literally, I can testify to this because yeah. Mark has gone to shows with me and he's like, Whoa, he, because you can feel it right and he right. goes off the, and he'll talk about it in a language of feelings like yeah. they don't look happy or why does that horse look worried or right she's right and in you know at the time he literally knew nothing <laughs> right so yeah, i mean yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but you know that right you feel it right. so yeah and he's not the victim of ignorance no you've been no. educated when i say to you you've been educated as a writer so you know yeah. it's right whether it's congruent or not it doesn't matter. You know, it's right. 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 And what you, what you vision training to be is that you make your sense of congruence, impose it on the horse. Well, the horse doesn't see it that way. Yeah. And if you're a good rider and a good trainer, your preoccupation is to find harmony. Right. In the horse, not to impose it. Yeah. yeah. Which means it's listening and relaxation which is easily said and that's quite another thing. thing. Oh, yes, they, yes. So that's my, that, I would say that's the biggest aha is the real, is the realization of that congruence and also that it actually has more to do with me than the horse. Yeah, yeah. And that, that seems to be, you know, a very common theme. Like no matter how we talk about it, right? We're talking about yeah. congruence. Right. You know, I've talked to other people, but this always comes back to what is going on in here and being right. centered and grounded wow. here, right? Uh, in order to have that with a horse, right? right. Like you got to get yourself right. So Craig, thank you uh, so much. It's been um, a pleasure. pleasure, very fascinating. And we've covered uh, like, we went yeah, to the we place, didn't cover great. Like I thought we were going to cover. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um so, uh, Craig, um, we're going to close. Thank you uh, for folks who are watching. Um, I will have information in the show notes. Um, Craig does regularly clinic in Europe and in the United States, and he also has a farm in Snohomish, Washington, where you're more than welcome to come out for an intensive, and they run clinics there as well. So, yes. This is, yes. So, please uh, check it out, and that'll be in the show notes. And um, this has been Under the Forelock. So, thank you, everybody.